This is a video on disorders of the esophagus. I'm going to be talking about all these disorders listed on the left here. I won't read through them now, but I'll talk about them one by one. In general, you can group these disorders into three categories. First, inflammatory disorders, um, disorders caused by too much inflammation. Then there are motility disorders. These are kind of functional disorders. The esophagus isn't doing its normal function of peristalsis, its normal mobility to get stuff down into the stomach. Lastly, structural disorders. There's something either occluding or restricting the passage of contents down into the stomach. So just kind of loosely defined categories for many disorders of the esophagus. Let's get started with GERD or gastrointestinal reflux disease. The pathophysiology here is that you have a weak lower esophageal sphincter. So if the esophagus is this tube that leads down into your stomach, at the bottom of the tube there's a lower esophageal sphincter that normally should be closed unless you're swallowing. GERD, or gastrointestinal reflux disease, is when some of this stomach acid and stomach contents refluxes back into the esophagus, and this can generally be unpleasant. It can cause heartburn, it can cause a burning chest or epigastric pain. This discomfort can be worse with spicy or acidic food, which makes sense. If something's spicy, it's going to burn more than if something is neutral or just water. It can be worse when you're supine, when you're laying on your back, and this can lead to a nocturnal asthma presentation, somebody that has a cough or somebody that has symptoms when they're lying on their back at night. Um, patients can also have a sour metallic taste, or nausea, or hoarseness. Now, a lot of people have GERD, and by itself it's not super concerning. What you do want to look out for is alarm symptoms, which might alert you to something worse going on, essentially cancer. Um, so what, what are the alarm symptoms for somebody that has GERD? First is dysphagia and odynophagia, so uh, difficulty swallowing and pain with swallowing. Somebody that has weight loss might make you think they might have an esophageal cancer. If they're anemic, if they have a GI bleed, if they have recurrent vomiting with their GERD. Older people um, tend to be more concerning if you have new onset, really bad GERD in older people, and people that use tobacco. You essentially want to, in these populations, investigate other etiologies before just saying they probably have uh, acid reflux. And you can usually just investigate that with an endoscopy and a biopsy. So how do you diagnose this? First, you, you, I mean, you can do a bunch of tests to diagnosis. The definitive test is a 24-hour pH monitor. And what you essentially do is you put a probe down into somebody's stomach and you kind of look at the pH of this area. And you correlate the acidity level to the patient's symptoms. Um, in order to do this, you need to stop their acid suppression. You need to stop any medications that they might be taking um, five days before. And if you can say, oh, you have heartburn when it's more acidic, then that's by definition GERD. But this is a pretty involved test, and most people don't do this. What they usually do is just try a PPI, try a proton pump inhibitor like omeprazole for six weeks and endorse some lifestyle changes. And if that resolves the symptoms and if the person feels better, then they likely had GERD. So it's kind of like an empiric trial of uh, PPIs and lifestyle changes. So the treatment, as I mentioned, these lifestyle modifications, you tell patients to avoid spicy and acidic foods, um, don't eat chocolate, don't eat um, lemon juice, uh, don't eat before bed, uh, have smaller meals, avoid laying down right after your meals, no smoking and alcohol. These are all things that precipitate acid reflux. Again, you give them these PPIs, these drugs that end in prazole, like omeprazole, pantoprazole. There are other drugs that work, H2R antagonists, so that's histamine 2 receptor antagonists. Those are the ones that end in tidine, like ranitidine. The definitive treatment for GERD is this Neeson fundiplication. It's essentially a surgery that uh, pulls the gastroesophageal sphincter upward, um, and it risks having the opposite problem. It risks having a sphincter that is too closed all the time. Um, usually don't end up doing the surgery. Usually with lifestyle modifications and PPIs, you can make people feel better. A complication for GERD is metaplasia. This is the cells kind of changing form because they've been constantly assaulted with acid. Oops. Uh, that's called Barrett's esophagus when the squamous cells of the bottom of the esophagus change into columnar epithelium. That can then lead to dysplasia, which can lead to adenocarcinoma. If that happens, then the patient requires resection. Um, they, they would have cancer at that point. They need chemo, radiation. Um, you can also have other problems with GERD. It doesn't always lead to cancer. It can also just lead to strictures and ulcers. Those would be considered endoscopic markers of GERD. If you, if you do endoscopy on a patient that has reflux and they have ulcers and strictures, you can pretty confidently say they have GERD. Okay, that was a long one. These should be a little shorter and easier. Next is caustic esophagitis. The pathophysiology here is damage of tissue via chemical origin. So something went into your esophagus from the top this time that it was caustic and caused damage. 
You can have occupational exposures. This is like fumes. If you work with like toxic chemicals, toxic gases, those fumes can mix with your saliva and you swallow them and that can damage your esophagus. You could have pica or people that just eat things that are inappropriate to eat of acidic or basic um, liquids, like the Tide Pod Challenge would be an example of that. You could have accidents in children, kids that just drink whatever laundry detergent or something caustic, or self-harm, somebody that drinks Drano um, in a suicide attempt. Those would all be caustic esophagitis. The symptoms here would be pretty severe chest pain, uh, odynophagia, which we said was painful swallowing. You can also have drooling, wheezing, and strider. The diagnosis here would be made with endoscopy. The treatment here is, first it's important to remember that you do not want to induce vomiting. You do not want to try to neutralize the acid or the base uh, by giving them the opposite. So if somebody swallowed an acid, definitely do not give them a base. The reason is that that's a very energetic reaction and it makes a lot of heat to neutralize an acid or a base. So you can end up giving them burns on the inside. You can make it worse essentially. If you try to induce vomiting, you're just gonna bring that caustic substance back up. So the actual treatment that you should do is if they have low severity, you like just shallow ulcers or erythema on endoscopy, you can transition them from liquids to solids in a day or two, and usually they get better from that. If they have high severity, like deep ulcers and circumferential burns, you wanna keep them as NPO for three days at least. So um, if low severity, keep them on liquids, kind of dilute what they uh, consumed, and they might be able to eat in a day or two. If it's bad, nothing for three days. The complications here are cancer and strictures. So usually you end up with strictures, two thirds of people, um, two or three percent get uh, cancer from this. And those people will require screening, like uh, EGDs as screening to make sure they don't develop cancer. Next is eosinophilic esophagitis. The pathophysiology here is a chronic immune mediated inflammation of the esophagus. It's kind of similar to an allergic reaction and it's actually comorbid with um, asthma, allergies, atopy. So it's kind of that IgE mediated um, response. The symptoms here are chest and epigastric pain. They might have reflux, they might have vomiting. People complain of difficulty swallowing food. Um, food is usually worse than liquids, so they'll complain of like solid dysphagia. Um, it, this is usually an intermittent problem, and that's important because it helps you differentiate it from achalasia, which is usually progressive, um, and it's usually and achalasia is usually difficulty swallowing solids and liquids. So eosinophilic esophagitis is difficulty swallowing solids more than liquids, and it's intermittent. This usually happens in like younger men in their 20s or 30s, or early 30s, and it's often when eating meat. The diagnosis here would be endoscopy. You'll see this furrowing, uh, whitish exudates. You might also see multiple stacked ring-like esophageal indentations as shown here. This uh, kind of pathology is called tracheolization of the esophagus. Normally the esophagus doesn't have these rings, it's usually smooth. Uh, the trachea does have these rings, so this is called tracheolization of the esophagus. If you take a biopsy during endoscopy, you'll see eosinophils, hence the name eosinophilic esophagitis. The treatment here starts like GERD. You could do dietary modifications and PPIs. You can also try aerosolized topical steroids like fluticasone or budesonide. The last option would be to dilate these strictures if they get really bad. Next is pill-induced esophagitis. The pathophysiology here is the direct effect of some medication on the esophageal mucosa. Um, usually happens when somebody takes a pill with not enough liquid or with not enough water. The pill usually gets caught in the middle of the esophagus. This is because the aorta or the left atrium sometimes presses on the esophagus back there and it kind of compresses it making it a little narrower than the rest of the esophagus. So the pill gets stuck there and then the pill has uh, inflammatory effects on the mucosa of the esophagus. There are some medications that are worse than others for this, specifically bisphosphonates. Um, potassium chloride is known to be bad. That causes an osmotic tissue injury. Tetracyclines are antibiotics that are bad. Those are acidic. NSAIDs disrupt the GI mucosa protection. The same thing they do in your stomach, they do in the esophagus, and that can cause pill-induced esophagitis. Antibiotics like doxycycline, clindamycin, um, and Bactrim can all cause uh, pill-induced esophagitis. This is usually worse with like the generic brand, the cheaper non-coated pills. If you buy the fancy name brand ones, sometimes they're covered in a layer of sugar or whatever that would uh, delay this effect. The symptoms here are sudden onset of dysphagia, dysphagia, and retrosternal page. Um, usually it's worse with people with gastrointestinal reflux disease. Um, maybe their mucosa is already damaged from, from acid reflux. The diagnosis is usually clinical. You can sometimes do endoscopy to confirm it, and you'll see an actual ulcer um, where the pill got stuck, and there's usually just normal mucosa around it. So it's very localized um, ulcer, localized 
uh, esophagitis. Treatment here is to stop the medication and to instruct the patient to take the medication with more water next time and while sitting up next time. So essentially prevent it from happening again. Next is infectious esophagitis. This is kind of self-explanatory. The esophagus can be infected with a virus, bacteria, or fungus, usually uh, opportunistic infections, and it's more likely in people that are immunosuppressed, such as people with HIV with a CD4 count less than 100, people that had previously had an organ transplant, leukemia, lymphoma, or are taking steroids. The symptoms here is odynophagia. Um, in general, the viral esophagitis is more painful than candida. So those are the ones we'll be talking about. The viral, which is herpes and CMV esophagitis and candidal esophagitis. So in the clinic um, for herpes esophagitis, if you suspect somebody has herpes esophagitis, they might also have oral or labial ulcers. That's your standard dew drops on a rose petal that you might see on the, on the mouth or on the genitals. In Canada, in um, at least 60% of cases, people that have Canada esophagitis will also have thrush, which are these white plaques that you'll see throughout the mouth. The definitive diagnosis would be an endoscopy and a biopsy. Somebody who has a biopsy, um, or sorry, an endoscopy with herpes, you'll see ulcerative round ovoid lesions. These are often described as volcano-like. And on biopsy, you'll see multinucleated giant cells. CMV, you'll see large linear ulcers in the distal esophagus. Um, and on biopsy, you'll see intranuclear inclusions. The treatment for these is uh, dependent on the disease. So herpes, they get valcyclovir or acyclovir. Um, if that doesn't work, you can use Foscarnet. CMV, they get val, sorry, valgancyclovir or gancyclovir. If that doesn't work, you can use Foscarnet. And Canada, people get fluconazole or nystatin. Next is achalasia. Pathophysiology here is that lower esophageal, this time, is refusing to relax, so it's too tight. Um, you get stuff that backs up, you're not able to push stuff through it. Symptoms are dysphagia to solids, liquids, usually progressive. So this is unlike the esoph uh, eosinophilic esophagitis, where that was intermittent, this is usually progressive. People will complain of having like a ball or a knot behind their sternum, and they might also have weight loss because they can't swallow food, and they might also have heartburn. Usually it takes a while to make this diagnosis because these people are usually told they have GERD, told to take PPIs, told to modify their diet, and it just gets worse and worse before they finally make the diagnosis. The, to make the diagnosis, you could do manometry. This shows a hyperactive contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter, even if the rest of the esophagus isn't doing anything. So you'll see no peristalsis throughout most of the esophagus and then a really, really strong tightening, um, really high... Uh, contraction of the lower esophageal sphincter. If the manometry is unclear, you can do a barium swallow. This is the classic bird's beak appearance that you'll see on the barium swallow with the narrowing at the gastroesophageal sphincter as shown here. So it looks like a bird kind of pointed down into the right. Cancer can also present similarly. So you might have somebody with cancer that presents with these signs and symptoms. Um, you can confirm, you can kind of differentiate these with an EGD uh, to rule out malignancy. So if somebody presents with these exact with this exact presentation, make sure it's not cancer first. The treatment is essentially to open the lower esophageal sphincter. You can do surgery, that's a laparoscopic myotomy. You can also do a pneumatic a balloon dilation. Usually you'll opt for surgery first, but if the person's not a good surgical candidate, you can get a myotomy, um, and, and cannot get a myotomy, you would probably do like nitrates and calcium channel blockers, but those usually don't work as well. Next is esophageal spasm. The pathophysiology here is impaired inhibitory innervation. So you end up with a bunch of uncoordinated simultaneous contractions of the esophageal body, kind of chaotic um, like this. The symptoms here is that it mimics myocardial infarction. So it sounds like somebody's having a heart attack. They'll complain of a retrosternal chest pain. It feels like it's crushing. It can be precipitated by stress. It could actually get better with nitrates. So nitrates are able to, to kind of dilate the esophagus just like um, they can dilate your veins, that helps with a heart attack. Um, the difference here is that you'll also have dysphagia with esophageal spasm. To diagnose this, you can first rule out a myocardial infarction, so do your EKG, check your troponins to make sure that they're not actually having a heart attack because it sounds the same. Then you can do manometry where you'll see diffuse erratic spasms of the middle and lower esophagus. So this can happen either spontaneously out of nowhere or you can do a stimulation test where you give them this ergonovine to stimulate the spasms, and that might be able to trigger them to help you make the diagnosis. You can also do a, an esophagram, a barium swallow, where you see this like corkscrew pattern, where you can kind of see like there's a contraction there, there's a contraction there, there's a contraction there, and together they make this corkscrew-like pattern. 
um, and this is non-peristaltic, so this is not helping stuff get down. It's just kind of chaotic and uncoordinated. The treatment here is to keep giving them the calcium channel blockers like diltiazem. Next is scleroderma. So this is a systemic disease of the body, but it affects the esophagus, so it's included here. The pathophysiology here is that you can have either atrophy or fibrosis of the smooth muscles in the lower esophagus. So this results in decreased peristalsis and abnormal tone in the lower esophageal sphincter. So this can be associated with the crest syndrome or the systemic sclerosis, so the more cutaneous one or the full body one. The symptoms here are heartburn and dysphagia, and some people will complain of having to drink liquid to swallow solid food. You can diagnose this with manometry, which will show a relaxed esophagus and low pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter. That would be the crest syndrome. Uh, in systemic sclerosis, they might have strictures, so you'll see strictures on uh, manometry as well. Treatment here is PPIs and dilation, similar to what you would do if somebody had stricture, isolated strictures or, uh, or isolated low pressure in the lower esophageal sphincter. Next is esophageal cancer. We'll talk about this pretty briefly. The pathophysiology here depends on the type of esophageal cancer. There's two major types. There's squamous cell carcinoma and there's adenocarcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma usually happens in the top of the esophagus, so like the upper third of the esophagus. It can be um, precipitated by smoking, um, by drinking hot liquids, a bunch of like hot coffee. Um, that can damage your proximal esophagus and that can cause squamous cell carcinoma. The adenocarcinoma usually happens in the bottom third of the esophagus and that can be caused by ongoing chronic GERD, which continually damages your distal esophagus because of that acid bouncing back up. Uh, again, Barrett's esophagus, when you have that um, squamous cell epithelium change into columnar cell epithelium and that can turn into adenocarcinoma. The risk factors, I kind of already mentioned these for squamous cell in the top esophagus is smoking, alcohol, and nitroso compounds, which I think are used as like preservatives. For adenocarcinoma in the lower esophagus can be caused by GERD and obesity. Symptoms for both are solid food dysphagia, you can have GI bleeding, you can have iron deficiency, and this can result in weight loss if they're not able to eat. The diagnosis can be made with a barium swallow. Uh, you don't want to immediately put a tube down there because you want to avoid perforating it accidentally. You can then do an EGD and a biopsy for a definitive diagnosis. Um, so on the barium swallow, you might see kind of a, an irregular pattern in the esophagus as shown here. I think this one was uh, adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. And you might also see like a large mass in the way as well. If you do confirm cancer, you then want to do CT to stage it, see if they have any metastases, see how big the esophageal cancer is, and the treatment for esophageal cancer is resection. Next is Zinker's diverticulum. This is a false diverticulum that happens when you have a weakened cricopharyngeous muscle. Um, this, leads, this leads to increased intraluminal pressure behind this weakened cricopharyngeous muscle which can then herniate through it and create a pseudo-diverticulum. So essentially what's happening is one of the muscles in the wall of the esophagus is weak, pressure backs up behind it and eventually pushes through that muscle and creates this weird outpouching where stuff can get stuck. Um, what can get stuck there? You can have water stuck there, you can have food stuck there. If food gets stuck there, it'll rot. Um, bacteria will just break it down and it'll have rotting food just kind of hanging out your throat. So the signs and symptoms are like foul, smelling breath. The technical term for that is halitosis. You can have difficulty eating, people that gurgle, cough, or aspirate, because if stuff is stuck there all the time, it's eventually gonna bounce back up eventually and uh, maybe make its way down your lungs. Some people might have recurrent pneumonia from that as well. So you can have people that regurgitate undigested food, progressive dysphagia. If you have a very large pouch, you might actually be able to feel it on exam. This usually happens in older people, in men more than women. To diagnose this, you can start with a swallow study with contrast esophagram. Um, this provides a nice anatomical and functional information. So this is an example of a barium swallow with somebody who has a Zenker's diverticulum, and you can see the diverticulum pretty clearly, how, where it is, how big it is, and uh, what their functional capacity is like. You can see that contrast gets stuck in the Zenker's diverticulum. The, um, scoping them here, the EGD isn't as good, and it's kind of risky because if you poke into that, you don't want to make it worse. You don't want to poke through it, and it might be confusing. You might think you're going down the, uh, the esophageal lumen and actually be in the, uh, in the, in the Zenker's diverticulum. The treatment here is to fix the problem by removing the muscle that caused the problem. So remove this cricopharyngeal muscle. Um, and you can, you can, if the diverticulum is huge, you can do a diverticulectomy.
and remove that completely. Next is esophageal stricture. This is the same picture I had on the scleroderma slide um, because esophageal strictures can happen in scleroderma. Um, somebody that has long-standing GERD can also get esophageal strictures, as I mentioned. Um, these can also happen in people who have caustic ingestion or uh, radiation. Essentially what happens is that these things cause a lot of inflammation, which cause scarring and stricture formation, which is the circumferential narrowing of the esophagus. The symptoms here are that you'll have dysphagia, difficulty, and pain swallowing solids. Sorry, probably not pain, just difficulty swallowing solids. This can lead to anorexia and weight loss. To diagnose this, you want to do a barium swallow. You'll see a small tightening area, and that is the stricture, and then you can confirm it with an EGD and a biopsy. And the biopsy helps you rule out a cancer that might also have this stricture effect. You can usually me medically manage these, um, manage the GERD that they cause. If they get really bad, you can do surgical resection. Next is this plumber vinson syndrome. Um, this one's weird because it used to be more popular, but it's becoming increasingly rare. So this typically presented in women. It would, they would have esophageal webs, as shown here, and rings in the upper esophagus um, versus Shatsky rings, which we'll talk about next, that happened in the lower esophagus. And these women also presented with iron deficiency. So esophageal webs, rings, and iron deficiency. Uh, it's not as common anymore. It's thought to be caused by like nutritional deficiencies, and now that most of the world has much better nutritional status, we're not seeing it as much. The, it would present with dysphagia, pain, and odynophagia, and it would predispose you to esophageal squamous cell carcinoma, and those people required regular screening. The treatment was to correct the iron deficiency anemia. Um, so if you see that, now you kind of know this triad for plumber vincent syndrome, but it's kind of it's kind of rare these days. Uh, Shatsky's ring, which I already alluded to, is a fibrous ring at the lower esophageal sphincter. Um, again, in contrast to the upper rings in plumber vinson syndrome. This is what it would look like on barium swallow, which is how you can diagnose it. You see that narrowed lumen here. Um, and if you see that, you might want to confirm it with an uh, EGD and biopsy. EGD might show you something like that. Um, the symptoms here are kind of similar to all the other ones, difficulty swallowing large boluses of food. Uh, sometimes it's been called steakhouse syndrome, where you'd be chewing a big piece of steak, can't swallow it, um, end up spinning it back up or having pain with, with swallowing it. Um, not all people who have rings have symptoms, so it's possible to have an obstruction, but it can be found incidentally. Uh, if you do have symptoms, the treatment is dilation and resection. Lastly, let's talk about esophageal tears, ruptures, and perforations. There's these two big disorders that are worth talking about. First is the Mallory-Weiss syndrome. This is uh, caused by a sudden increase in abdominal pressure, such as in forceful vomiting or in blunt abdominal trauma. This can cause superficial mucosal tears, usually at the gastroesophageal junction, and submucosal artery or venous plexus bleeds. So essentially, you're, you have a really high pressure in your stomach, either from barfing or from like being punched in the gut or a car accident that hits you in the gut. Uh, and you have bleeding, you're, you're spitting up blood. So the symptoms are bright red emesis um, and epigastric pain. And um, the diagnosis is made by endoscopy that shows longitudinal lacerations, so shown here. Notice that these lacerations are only as deep as the mucosa. They don't go all the way through the esophagus. Uh, the treatment here is that they usually resolve spontaneously. If they don't, you can do endoscopy and put some epinephrine all over that and also cauterize if there's persistent bleeding. Again, these are only mucosal deep tears. If they're deeper and if they're full tears, full thickness tears, that's esophageal rupture. Um, Esophageal rupture is when you have a tear of the esophageal wall. It can be caused by a variety of things, such as a procedure. It could be iatrogenic. Um, trauma, again, car accidents might, might rip your esophagus in half. Esophagitis, if you have pill esophagitis that gets really bad, um, that can also rupture your esophagus. Or efforts, like vomiting. In the case of vomiting, when you vomit your esophageal into a tear, that's called Boerhaave syndrome. The symptoms for esophageal rupture are pretty painful. So you have chest and back pain. You can have a pleural effusion with a low pH and a high amylase content. Amylase is in your saliva. So if you have high amylase in your uh, pleural effusion, that could be a sign of esophageal rupture. You might have food contents. Food contents shouldn't be in your pleural effusion. You can also have an atypical green color from bile in your pleural effusion. Uh, if you have esophageal rupture, you might have a systemic inflammatory response. The person might be tachycardic, tachypneic. This can lead to mediastinus, and you can um, kind of have inflammation all over the mediastinum. This can lead to shock, 
You can also see pneumomediastinum and pneumothorax. So essentially gas, food, uh, bile, amylase, and places that it shouldn't be. On exam, you might see crepitus or even crunching on auscultation. That's called the Hammond sign. And you can see in widened mediastinum on chest x-ray. So this is pretty severe compared to everything else we've talked about. The diagnosis here is made with esophagy, or sorry, esophagography or CT with water-soluble contrast. You want to remember to use water-soluble contrast and not barium, because if you do have a rupture, you don't want to leak barium all over the mediastinum, which can worsen the inflammatory response. The treatment here is emergent surgery for debridement and repair. You'll also give these patients IV antibiotics, especially if they have mediastinum and shock. Um, obviously make them NPO, because if they're going to swallow stuff, it's just going to end up in their chest cavity, which is terrible, and PPIs so that their stomach acid doesn't further cause damage to uh, their mediastinum. So these two are the big ones for esophageal tears and rupture and perforation. So this was a kind of a long video on esophageal disorders. I hope it was helpful. Thank you for listening.